Ireland in 1920. The country in the midst of a war of independence against British rule here. That war seeing many casualties and tragedies, none more so notorious than what happened on the 21st of November 1920 at Croke Park, where 14 people went to either play in or watch a game of football between Dublin and Tipperary. They never returned home. That day forever remembered as Bloody Sunday. In 1920, Ireland was at a state of war. The War of Independence had been raging since 1919, but it really ratcheted up uh, from the summer of 1920 with the, first of all, the arrival of the Black and Tans, and then in July 1920, the arrival of the Auxiliaries. Um, so by late 1920, you had uh, you know, IRA ambushes being uh, meted with bulked up uh, British policing, primarily the uh, Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries. A trend developed in 1920 as well that any time the IRA um, had ambushes or had attacks on police forces, it usually was met with reprisals from the British. And most commonly, the people who were punished the most were civilians, who had nothing to do with the uh, activities of the IRA. The GEA, like many organisations, was affected by the War of Independence. Although it did uh, lead to some delay in some games, there still was an active programme in 1920 of GEA fixtures. Um, and actually Leinster was very vibrant around the time of 1920. That famous Wexford team had won their last All-Ireland of their four in a row in 1918. And then uh, in, in 1919, Kildare won the All-Ireland final. So it, months before Bloody Sunday, Dublin met Kildare in the Leinster final and they, and they, they defeated them with, with a crowd of about 30,000. So the GA was still active, although games were delayed, particularly in Munster and Connacht and elsewhere. Um, but Dublin was going through a, a very much a purple patch, not just in Gaelic football, but also in hurling. They actually ended up winning the All-Ireland Hurling Final. And one of their star players was Frank Burke, who played for a hurling team and the Gaelic football team. The backbone of that Dublin team was the O'Toole's Club in, in several places. And they, they actually um, um, got to the All-Ireland Final in 1920. So they, they could have won the, the double, but they were stopped actually by Tipperary in the 1920 All-Ireland Football Final, which, which actually was played in June 1922. The game itself that, that happened on Bloody Sunday was a challenge match uh, between Dublin and Tipperary, and it was for the dependence fund of Republicans who'd either been killed or uh, who were wounded um, from the War of Independence. The, the Tipperary Dublin match was preceded by a replayed intermediate Dublin football final between Dunleary Commercials and Aaron's Hope. On the morning of 21st of November 1920, Michael Collins' the squad and other members of the IRA struck a number of homes and hotels around Dublin where they killed 15 suspected members of the British intelligence services. The British Crown forces were hell-bent on revenge and they suspected that many of the people who were involved in the morning's killings would be attending a Gaelic football match that afternoon between Dublin and Tipperary, held here at Croke Park. The original plan was for the British Army and the police forces to search the men about a quarter of an hour before the match ended. So from this direction, which where the uh, British Army were stationed uh, near um, um, Dublin, what is Dublin Airport now. They arrived at quarter past three, just as the match was about to start. The British Army's job was to block the exits, not allow any people to leave. And it was the, uh, the police forces of the RIC, the DMP, the Black and Tans of the Auxiliaries, it was their job to search the men. 10 minutes after the match started, at 25 past three, the British Army members and ticket sellers saw members of the police forces arriving from this bridge. At 25 past three, just here at Russell Street and Jones Road, the combined force of the RAC, DMP, Black and Tans aux Auxiliaries were seen arriving in large convoys. They stopped here, stopped the convoys here at 25 past three, 
and looking into Croke Park. Croke Park was a very different complex back in 1920. There was no stand. People could see into the pitch. At 25 past three, members of the uh, British police forces started shooting into the grounds. There was uh, one boy, William Perry Robinson. He looked around to see what the commotion was. He was perched on a tree. He was the first victim shot, he fell from the tree. The second victim was a 10 year old, Jerome O'Leary. He was shot in the head by the, the police who shoot, shot here on uh, Russell Street, Jones's Road. There was another boy victim as well, John William Scott. He died from a ricochet bullet that tore his chest. His wounds were so bad that they actually thought he was bayoneted to death. Another victim, Michael Fury, he was uh, trying to escape from all the commotion from, from the shooting. He impaled himself on a spike in a fence and later died of his wounds. As usual, we went into Crow Park. Used, that time you used to go in the canal end and just as you go in, you'd be confronted by a big bank, you know, just a big bank, like there was no stands or terrace in there and uh, made our way round to the hill. That bank we used to go round to the where you now where the, the vision is now where you come up when you're going into the Cusick stand mm -hmm. and then start at the hill. That bank was just clay, like a clay bank. And then the hill was it was rubble, it was clinkers and that, you know. But we went to our usual spot, which was the railway wall behind the railway goal. So you could you could come in at one end and walk right around right, to the opposite end. Right around, you know. But if you were going in, you could come on to in the hill. There were gates around there. But that was the nearest gate to us. We went right. in there. So the trouble now you're talking about uh, that you'd heard about earlier in the morning, that was uh, uh, the killing of uh, several correct. members of the British forces. Correct. That was correct. That was... Uh, and, and the big match was a challenge game between Dublin between and Tipperary. Dublin and Tipperary. Yes. And there was lots in the paper beforehand about it, you know. So uh, we were there just as usual. And then the match started. And the match was on about 10 minutes when we heard these bangs. But at that time, you think they were slap bangs, you know. We didn't know what it was until... After a while, we noticed everyone running towards the gates and shouting and screaming. These bangs kept going on. Yeah. But uh, when we got down at that time, over where the new uh, stand is now, you see, the, there was no wall around Crow Park. It was a galvanised hoarding of about, we'd say about eight feet high or seven to eight feet high in that. And, we rushed down the hill. You had to slide down the hill, down the back, you know, there was no steps no step. or anything. We slide down and everyone, but everyone was trying to get to the gates out and they were full. And but we got to this galvanise and some men there lifted us up and pushed us on the top. We had to jump down over. And about how many people would you say were at the match that day? I mean, since it was a challenge, it couldn't have been a huge crowd. No, no, I think there was something, something about 8,000, I think, were oh, there. And the red yeah. Well, uh, had you any idea at the time where the shots came from? I believe they came yeah, from, from from the railway. Even after they came from the hill, because you could see, you can see, oh, you see, the uh, the hill that I said when you when you come into the ground wasn't as big as the uh, terrace is now, you know, yeah. and it even wasn't as big as the wall where the people sit on, you know, wasn't as tall as that, and uh, you could see right into the pitch from the canal bridge. Like, you know, coming down, there were no posts, but there was no hoardings or anything. You could see right in the pitch. Once the shooting had started, pandemonium set in all over the pitch. The RAC and the auxiliaries of the Black and Tans, they rushed into the canal and turnstiles and started shooting indiscriminately and pretty much around the Hill 60 side. A, a mad scramble um, happened all over the pitch where people tried to get out of the ground. Over here behind me is the Cusick stand. There was, of course, no Cusick stand in 1920. There was a big wall there which led on to a Belvedere Ruby uh, sports ground. And many people tried to jump over and climb over that wall, which is about 20 feet at the time, to get away from the shooting. One of those was Patrick O'Dowd. He was 57 years of age. Um, as he was helping people over the wall, he was shot in the head. Another person was James Matthews. He also was found dead around that vicinity. Joe Trainer, an upcoming footballer from Ballymount, who was captain of the Young Emmett's team, he was shot in the back around this direction. As people started panicking, there was a mad crush, a mad stampede, pretty much around the Hill 60 side. Uh, two people died from that crush, uh, James Burke and James Tehan. 
And one of the people who was uh, running with her, her fiancé was Jane Boyle. She was running with her fiancé away from the shooting. Um, his name was Daniel Byron. Daniel felt Jane's hands lose her grip and she got lost in the stampede. She was shot in the back and was uh, crushed as well. She was due to marry Daniel that Friday, the following Friday. Instead, she was buried in her wedding dress in Glastevin Cemetery. I recall my father telling us that when the shooting started, there was a lot of confusion in Cole Park and going around. And he made his way, he saw somebody, he made his way up to under Hill 16, where my Uncle John was playing, and saw someone hurt lying on the ground. He thought it might have been him, but it, it wasn't because there was a cold over him. And so it wasn't him. My Uncle John had made his way down, ran down the canal and climbed over the canal wall and swam across the canal and made his way down to a place to the family home in Sheriff Street. The teams Tipperary and Dublin were taken off the pitch and un brought under the stands and dressing rooms where they were questioned about various elements of the thing. And they were there for a long time and eventually they were told to go home and dress and leave. My father then made his way down to uh, his home in Sheriff Street. There's a lot of stories saying that uh, Tipperary players stayed in houses down the civil place which was adjacent to a hundred civil place, which was the O'Toole's clubhouse. Now I know that some of the Tipperary players stayed in my father's, Stephen's and John's house in Sheriff Street that night and went home the next morning. As the shooting was ongoing, all of the footballers hit the ground. Over here, which is now Hill 16, but in 1920 was called Hill 60. The uh, Dublin forward, Frank Bork, was being marked by uh, the cornerback of Tipperary, Michael Hogan. Frank Bork heard Michael Hogan say, I'm shot. He crawled to the ground where Tom Ryan, a spectator from Wexford, went over to him. And as, he's, as Tom Ryan was whispering the act of contrition to the dying Michael Hogan, he himself was shot and later died. The first, the first thing that struck us, we, those of us who had volunteer training, was to lay prone on the ground and fall on that. Uh, a voice, a consolation voice, shouted out the firing blanks. A minute later, it was obvious they weren't firing blanks. Sparks started to fly out of the railway wall and uh, people started to roll down from the embankments and it was obvious that people were getting shot. We were laying prone, we lay still prone and the backs, our backs and the uh, forwards, the Dublin forwards, Rushed away, fr rushed away from the fire end, from the canal end of it, and they rushed towards the railway uh, exit. That is how the backs were ahead of us who were in the centre field. Then, they, as the firing continued, they decided, oh, the, both the Dublin and the teams decided to leave in pairs, lift automatically in pairs, t two pairs left, Hogan was in the top pair that got up to go, and as he did, he fell forward. I was within about three yards of him at the time, lay in the centre field, when, as he fell forward and fell to the ground, I saw the blood gushing from through his jersey. and he spurted, spurted up. I knew that he was shot and slipped across towards him and, and, and heard the words, Jesus, Mary and Joseph from his lips. And I decided to rush for my life and try and get out. In 1920, the Secretary General of the GEA, Wicklow man, Luke O'Toole, he actually resided here at the corner of Hogan and Canal End. Um, he had a house, resided in a house here uh, that was provided to him by the GEA. And many, when the commotion started, when the shooting started, many people took refuge in his house. Uh, Luke had actually a second role, and that was, uh, he was the groundsman for the, for the pitch and the site as well. So, uh, the, to oversee both functions, the GAA uh, provided him with a house on site so that he could oversee these duties and roles. The house was actually sited over in the very corner between the old canal end and uh, old Hogan stand. And, and that site was the house and that's where Luke reared his family and where our parents uh, were and it's their memories that they uh, experienced on that day from that from in and around that house on that day. 
Seamus will recall that uh, he was outside the house and heard this in, in, enormous sound and which was followed by the sight of an, uh, an, an aeroplane flying very low over Crow Park and followed shortly by commotion and uh, gunshot uh, fire. With that, with the shock of that, he ran into his ho- into the house. His grandmother, my, 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 he ran into his mother, my grandmother, Bridget O'Toole, sent him upstairs for safety. He was followed very shortly up that stairs by a number of gents who were asking where is the escape route that they knew Luke O'Toole had from that house. You'll see the, photo, the photograph here up behind me on the wall. That, is, that was a photograph of Michael Collins, Harry Boland and my grandfather poking around a ball at the Leinster Horan final, final some a uh, couple of months before and Luke uh, and my Bridget, my grandmother, had regular 25 card games in that house in Crow Park and Collins, Boland, uh, Dan Breen, JJ Walsh, Jack Shouldice and many others visited there uh, for those games. Now bearing in mind that the War of Independence was uh, very much uh, uh, raging outside so they had to have an escape route uh, uh, just in case the house was raided during those uh, card games. An escape route they had. Upstairs, under the, the bedroom, under the bed, they had a large plank, and that plank was used to open the, the uh, open window and at the back of Luke's house and that, uh, to gain access into Bertie Donnelly's next-door house. And that was the, the, the route those, my father witnessed those men escaping on and uh, away from Crow Park. While all this was was uh, was while while all this uh, while that activity was going on, the auxiliaries outside realised, or someone told them that people were escaping out through Luke O'Toole's house, and they surrounded the house and and broke in. The auxiliaries uh, uh, gave my grandmother Bridget O'Toole appalling abuse, uh, and caused absolute mayhem in the house, um, and went on for quite a bit apparently. Not all of the victims on Bloody Sunday were killed in the grounds of Crow Park. One of the victims, Daniel Carr, escaped the chaos and was uh, walking home um, on Russell Street when he was shot in the tie and later died from his wounds. He wasn't the last victim though. The last victim was 19-year-old Tom Hogan, who was, was shot in the arm. This, his arm had to be amputated, but unfortunately gangrene set in and he died five days later, the 14th at last victim of Bloody Sunday. Jane Boyle, Lanark Street, Dublin. James Burke, Windy Arbour, Dublin. Daniel Carroll, Temple Derry, Tipperary. Michael Feary, Gardner Place, Dublin. Mick Hogan, Grange Mokler, Tipperary Tom Hogan Tankardstown Limerick James Matthews North Cumberland Road Dublin Patrick O'Dowd Buckingham Street Dublin Jerome O'Leary Blessington Street Dublin William Robinson, Little Britain Street, Dublin. Tom Ryan, Glen Bryan, Wexford. John William Scott, Fitzroy Avenue, Dublin. James Tehan, Tipperary. Joseph Trainer. Ballymount, Dublin.